Good morning. Welcome to spring. Um, it's a great weekend, eh? Unless you're a snowmobiler. Um, if you're a golfer, it's good. Right, Phil? Phil went yesterday. Um, that's amazing. Let's, uh, let's pray. We've got a lot to cover today, a difficult passage. Let's, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we have just been singing about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and we recognize that as part of the Godhead, we need him. We desire him in our lives. We desire him in this place. We know that he convicts us of sin, that he guides us into truth, that within us there is a process going on where he is making us more and more like your son. And so we welcome that in our lives today. We welcome that. We welcome him in our lives this morning as we open your word. We, we need you. We need him. As we read about Jesus and we read about what he communicated to his followers, we understand that these words are for us. And so I pray that what was said so long ago in the upper room on the night that he was betrayed, as we look at that this morning, that we would realize the implications for us, that we, would, that we would realize the truth for us today. And Father, as we gather here this morning, there's all kinds of things that, that can distract us from that, from hearing from you. I pray that we would put those aside, that you would put those aside, that we can focus on this teaching and what it tells us and how it in, is impressed upon our lives. And we need the Spirit's help to do that. And so we ask these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I would invite you to go to John chapter 14. We were there last week, and, and we'll continue to be there as a, as a springboard to a series that we're going to talk about on prayer. Um. John 14, verse 12 to 17 this morning is, is where I want to land. So let's, uh, let's read this together. If you have your Bibles, you want to follow along, it's going to be on the screen as well. Jesus, in the upper room, says this to his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus gathers together in the upper room, and this would be his last lesson, his last teaching to his disciples before uh, he would be going to the cross, before he would give his life for them. So, uh, I mean, he, he's communicating deep truths to them, and this is a difficult passage of Scripture this morning. It, it can be misunderstood, it can be misinterpreted, so I want to take some time to sort of walk, walk through it with you this morning. Um, he, he's taught his disciples well. They've been with him for, for nearly three years at this point, and they're following him. They're watching him. They're, uh, they're doing the things that he's asked them to do. They're seeing what he does. They're, uh, they're understanding how he interacts with people. They're seeing the miracles that, that point to the fact that he is the Son of God. They're, they're witness to those things. And he says to them, in the upper room that night, he says, whoever believes in me, and he's talking to a group of people who believe in him, who have followed him, and, 
And it is for them as it is for us. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, this promise that he says to his disciples is also for you. It's also for us. If, if you're here this morning and you are not a follower of Christ, my prayer is that today that you will become a follower. That's the purpose of the Gospel of John. Later on in the Gospel of John, we read these words. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. But what we find in this passage is that Jesus is at work in us, and he continues his work in us. He continues the work that he was doing. He continues that through us. He says that to his disciples. He gives that to his disciples. We see um, we, we see indications of that in the New Testament as we, as we read further. But he says to his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Will also do the works that I do. Let's deal with that first. Jesus says the person who believes in him will do the things that he does, will do the works that he does. Now right off the bat, I think that we can create some problems for ourselves in that passage. Because we start thinking about Jesus' most amazing miracles. And I mean, even to this point in the Gospel of John, we see some of the things that he has done. Jesus has turned water into wine. Jesus has discerned the heart of a Samaritan woman at this point. He's, he's healed an official's son. He has healed a man who has been crippled for 38 years. He, he heals a man who was blind. He walks on the water. He takes a boy's lunch and feeds 5,000 people from it. And he raises Lazarus from the dead. And it's not that Lazarus had just died. He had been dead for almost four days at this point. Calls him out of the grave and Lazarus comes out. He raises him from the dead. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Does that mean what Jesus is saying here is that every follower of Jesus is going to do these things? Jesus says, you're going to do these miracles? Now, we see indications of that in the book of Acts. But is that what Jesus is saying here? Or is he saying, well, maybe you'll do one or two of these things. Maybe you'll do some of these things. Maybe you'll do all of these things. In other parts of the New Testament where miracles are mentioned, they're described as, as a gift that some Christians have, but not all. Look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as it comes on the screen. It says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. I might not have that verse, sorry. Um, just listen as I read. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. So we think about that passage, I don't think, in the passage of John, I don't think that Jesus is saying that we will do all these miracles, and we will do even greater miracles than he has done in that sense. I think it has to mean something else, and it's very important for us to understand what it does mean. Jesus says in verse 11 of John 14, if you want to look there, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So there's a connection in the context between verse 11 and verse 12 here. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So the word believe and the word works occur together in verse 11, just like they do in verse 12. The works that Jesus did are designed to help people believe. They're helped to point people to him. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that when the Messiah came, that he would do miracles. 
It, it, would, it, it would uniquely set him apart as the Messiah, as he would heal the blind, as he would heal the lame, as he would open, open the eyes of the blind, is, is the passage in the Old Testament that we see. He would do miracles. He would, he, he would show that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He would be uniquely set apart as the Messiah. And, and so these passages of Scripture are, are doing that. He would be the deliverer. He would be the redemption. He is the one that people are waiting for to free them from sin. And so each and every one of these miracles is, is a little pocket of deliverance. We see uh, really what's set apart here is that man has an inability to heal himself. Uh, man has an inability to, uh, to be delivered from demons, to, to, to open the eyes of the blind. And it's only God that can do that. And so Jesus is uniquely showing here that he has in him the power of God. He's the Messiah. A person who is possessed by a demon couldn't deliver themselves. A blind man couldn't heal themselves. A, 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 lay, a, a dead man could not raise himself from the dead. Only the Messiah would do that, and it was prophesied in such a way. Jesus says, believe on account of the works. In other words, he's saying, if the testimony of my mouth is leaving doubts in your mind about who I am, Look at the things that I do. Look at what I do. Let the works join with the things that I am saying. And let them point to the fact that I am the Messiah. Let them point you to faith. That's what verse 11 says. Then verse 12 follows. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now put verse 11 and verse 12 together, and let what the works accomplish, that is leading someone to faith, pointing someone to faith, let them be the same in both verses. And so verse 11, it says, the goal of my works is to lead people to faith in me. And in verse 12, it says, when you believe in me, I will work in you, and your works, like mine, will also lead people to faith. As we see throughout the book of Acts, we see the disciples that are, that are doing these miracles. They're speaking in tongues. They're, they're healing. They're doing miraculous things. What are they doing? They're authenticating the message that they've been given to help people be pointed to faith in God. So the context of this passage, what I want you to be familiar with, is that there is a connection between these two verses, and you have to look at them in the context and it goes like this, believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. That's what Jesus says. That's what he has said. Those are his words. But then he goes on to say, or else believe in me on account of my works. Let my works point you to faith because whoever believes in me will also do works that lead people to believe in me. We can't miss that in this passage of Scripture. So when we look at this, we look at passages of Scripture like it. We look at Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, where it says, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, this not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Then what does it say? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works that he has prepared in advance for us to do. And why do we do these good works? So that we can lead people to him. So that people would look at us. So that people would see what we're doing and not see, wow, what a, uh, what a great person that guy is. But that they would be pointed to Jesus. Because that's the goal of the works that he's given us to do. So whatever the specific works are that Jesus had in mind for us to do, what defines them here is that they point to Jesus, that they help people believe in him. They are a witness along with the words that Jesus says to help people believe in him. He says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, the works that point people 
to faith, if you are a believer, if you are a follower in Jesus, that's what your life is. You are his workmanship. You are uniquely created, uniquely gifted. You are uh, special. You are valued. You are important. You are imperative. You are an imperative part of the work of God, of the extension of the work of God, and you've been given good works to do so that your life is a display of Jesus. So at least we can say with confidence in verse 12, Jesus means that believers will be marked by this. They will be so united to Jesus that they will carry on the work by his power and do the kinds of things that he did that will point people to Jesus. And not only that, in verse 13, he goes on to say, and greater works than these will you do because I'm going to the Father. So if we determine what he did to be miracles beyond description, walking on water, feeding the 5,000, healing the blind, healing the lame, raising people from the dead, these are miracles beyond description. What does he mean that we will do even greater things than that? Have you seen somebody do greater things than that? If you think greater works means more miraculous, I think you're going to be really hard-pressed to surpass walking on water. I think you're going to be really hard-pressed to feed 5,000 people with, with a small lunch and raising the dead. I don't know any Christian who's ever lived inside of the New Testament or outside of the New Testament who has ever done all three of those miracles, let alone something more miraculous than that. So what does Jesus mean? Again, remember that the New Testament tells us not to expect it for all Christians. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says, Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? The answer that that Paul is looking for there as he writes that is, is no. We don't all do those things. We don't do all of those things. Which means when Jesus says, whoever believes in me, greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. He, it probably didn't mean that every Christian should expect to do things more miraculous than Jesus. More miraculous than the things that uniquely pointed people to Christ. That he was the Messiah because he was accomplishing those things. No Christian has ever done this. So Jesus says that his disciples will not only continue his works, but they will do greater ones because he goes to the Father and on top of the miracles that that I've mentioned, you know, the water to wine, the healing of the 5,000, the walking on the water, the, the raising from the dead, on the way to the Father, what does Jesus do? He goes to the cross. Jesus goes to the cross and he takes our sin upon himself and it's crucified there. And then he goes into the grave, he's buried, he's dead, and he raises from the dead. So what are the greater works that he says we will do? Salvation, up to this point, of Jesus ascending into heaven, was promised. It was anticipated. It was future. There were Old Testament promises of a Messiah coming, one who would save, one who would redeem, one who would deliver, one who would set things right, and now Christ has been crucified. He's been buried. He's been raised from the dead, and he has ascended into heaven, and he is now at the right hand of the Father. And he sent now the the person of the Holy Spirit into the world And the great purchase of forgiveness by the Messiah is is now finished once and for all. What was anticipated, what was promised, is now here. So I think Jesus would have said, even when I have forgiven sinners during my, my earthly life, I have forgiven them in anticipation of what is to come, of the fact that I will go to the cross you know, I've said before that the cross is like, is like a hinge in a door. I mean, there's one side, you have, you have the anticipation of Christ. You have the anticipation of the Messiah. And then, and then on the other side, you have 
looking back to the Messiah. It's the finished work of the cross. And the cross is, is a hinge where you have these two sides, one looking forward, one looking back. And Jesus is the key to it all. So Jesus says to his disciples, I've forgiven in anticipation of that. Hebrews 11 tells us this great long list of people in the Old Testament who had done all these great things, all of them in anticipation of the cross, all of them in anticipation of what's going to happen. But they never saw it themselves. They never, they were on the other side of it happening. So they believed God, and the scriptures tell us it was credited to them as righteousness. But we are forgiven in the name of Jesus because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Jump down to verse 16 for a second. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. He says to his disciples, when I die, and when I am raised again from the dead, when I ascend into heaven, I am not going to leave you. I am not going to leave you without help. I'm going to send a helper to you. He says to his disciples, you will receive the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit will be in you, and, and the Spirit that is in you is the Spirit of the crucified and risen Christ. The message that you preach will be the message not of a promised Messiah, but it will be of a paid ransom, a, a complete payment. It will be a finished action, and you will be witnesses to it. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 11 say this, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ doesn't belong to him, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. The same Spirit that was at work in Jesus as he walked on the earth, Jesus is God. But as he lived as a man, he was limited in his aspects of his deity. He had to have constant communion with his father in prayer. To know what his will was. To know that he was going to be obedient to him. To know that he did his father's will and only his father's will. He learned, he grew he gained knowledge, and he was dependent on the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The Scriptures tell us that God the Father anointed Jesus the Son with the Holy Spirit, and with power. He, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So Jesus reminds his followers about himself and how God is working in him. And then he tells them that he will do these things, that they will do these things, and you know what? You will do even greater things. the same spirit will be at work in them. So if you are a follower of Jesus this morning, if you are a believer in Jesus this morning, do you realize what this means? Before the resurrection of Jesus, 
Nobody in the history of the world ever had that, ever, ever had the spirit of the resurrected Christ living in them, not even Jesus. And the power of that absolutely new experience, the indwelling, the sending of the Holy Spirit to live in our lives, your works of love, of grace, forgiveness, and union with Christ to give you life in his name will point people to the risen Son of God. And you will be the instrument of their forgiveness based on the finished work of Christ. This will be new. This will be greater than Jesus' earthly miracles because this is what Jesus came to accomplish in his death and his resurrection, that the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, would live in you and would live in you and would live in me. Not more spectacular works. He's the Messiah. He's uniquely gifted. Because of that, people were pointed to himself. People were anticipating that. But we begin to see what this looks like in the early church. In the book of Acts, we see that gathered together in the upper room after the, the ascension of Jesus are some 120 disciples, and they're fearful, and they're frightened, and they're praying, and, and they're huddled together. After three years, Jesus' ministry, his, his work in, in amongst these people, 120 followers of Jesus. And just a few short days later, an ordinary fisherman gets up and he, he gives a message and 3,000 people are converted. Does that qualify as greater works? Absolutely. So we could say that they are greater in extent, that they are greater in influence because the Holy Spirit is at work in people's lives. He's filling them. He's giving them power. He's giving them boldness to preach the message, to proclaim the message of Jesus. He's, he, he's working in, in the one who doesn't know Christ yet. He's convicting them of sin. He's, he's guiding them into truth. He's helping them to understand what Jesus has done for them. We can't do that. The Spirit does that. That's why prayer is so important in evangelism. They speak with greater clarity because the cross and the resurrection are behind and they are witness to them and we are witness to them. We have the ability to take the word of God and to read it and to understand that Jesus is real and that what he has done for us is a fact. It's the promise of God fulfilled in Christ. He's faithful to his promise. And so we speak of them not as a, a promise. We speak of what Jesus did not as a promise, but we speak of them as fact, as actual events that actually happened. Does that qualify as greater? Absolutely. Because not even Jesus could speak of them in those terms. He hadn't gone to the cross yet. He hadn't fulfilled all the promises of God yet. What are the greater works that you will do, all of you? You will receive the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of the crucified and risen Christ. The Holy Spirit, you see, is, is the first gift to us of the cross. So what does this have to do with prayer? Still two verses there we haven't looked at. Look at 13 and 14 with me. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That sounds like prayer, but I think that's the hardest part of this passage. Whatever you ask, God will do. What makes it hard for me, and maybe what makes it hard for you, is the whatever. Because we can think of all kinds of things that we would ask. We can think of all kinds of things that we do ask, and, and they're not given to us. They're not answered in, in the things that we've asked, in the way that we've asked them. And so we come to a passage like this, and we say, whatever? Whatever I ask? Really, God? Whatever? 
But this passage is qualified here at the end when Jesus says that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Answers to prayer that we ask bring glory to God. If we ask something and God answers that request, it brings glory to God. Now we can think of all kinds of prayers that if they were answered would not bring glory to God, can't we? If God answered some of the prayers that we ask, he would not be glorified. Prayer exists like everything else to show us the glory of God. Prayer exists like everything else to to bring glory to God. Therefore, any prayer that doesn't imply your name be praised or as Jesus prayed, hallowed be your name, any prayer that doesn't do that has no claim on this verse has no claim on the whatever. It further goes on to say, whatever you ask, it's further qualified by in Jesus' name. Now, we say that all the time, don't we? We end the majority of our prayers, I think, in Jesus' name. So is that all it is? We tack that phrase onto the end of any prayer, and God's going to hear it, and God's going to answer it, just because we've said in Jesus' name? Is it a magic formula? Is it some kind of Christian mantra? We're not praying in Jesus' name just because we say it. And what it actually means is this. It actually means relying on the person and the work of Jesus. And if you are relying on that, then you are praying in Jesus' name. Nobody gets an answer to prayer by asking God for something without depending on what Jesus has done. Nobody. Christ is the one who by his blood and by his righteousness has purchased for sinners every blessing in the heavenly places. So therefore every prayer I pray in Jesus' name has to be based on the fact that Jesus has died. He has given his life. He has been raised from the dead. And by believing in him, we can have life in his name. So what's the application of this? I think the first thing that we learn from this passage is that we need to be involved in things that are going to, pe- that are going to point people to the risen Christ. We need to be doing things that are going to point people to the risen Christ. Christ. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God has prepared beforehand. God has prepared in advance for us to do. We live in a time where we have all kinds of resources. You know, we can read about the risen Christ. We can understand about the risen Christ. We can look back on the cross. We can look back on the resurrection of Jesus. We have the Old Testament that, that looks forward, we have the New Testament that looks back, and we live in light of that. We have all these resources. We have the Bible in our own language that we can pick up and that we can read and that we can study and we can talk about. And more than that, we have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead living in us. The same spirit that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at our disposal. What, what more resources do we need? We need to be engaged in things that are going to point Jesus, point people to Jesus. Remember that he works also in those who don't know him yet. That he's convicting them of sin. That he's guiding them into truth. And so we depend on the Spirit as we're pointing people to Jesus, as we're using the words of Jesus, as we're giving the gospel to people with our lives and with our words. The same Spirit that's at work in us, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, 
is the same spirit that's working in those people who don't know him yet. And so we pray. We pray for that because we have to be obedient. But it's God who does the work. Second thing I think we find from this passage is that we want to pray prayers that are going to bring great glory to God when they are answered. We need to pray bigger and bolder prayers. Because Jesus has done what he did. He is the mediator between us and the Father so we can pray. And when we pray based on that, in Jesus' name, when our prayers are answered, God is glorified. And because Jesus has done what he did, he has sent the Holy Spirit. And that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us and works in us so that we should be praying in such a way that the Father is glorified through the Son. You know, our problem is not that we ask too much of God, I don't think. I think our problem is that we ask too little of God. We we lower the bar for God. It's It's like we say, you know, we don't want God to be embarrassed. We don't want God to be humiliated. But this is not what honors God. If God is honored when we ask him the easy stuff and he answers it, How much more honored is he when we ask him the big stuff and he answers it? When we ask those things that only he can do, then he alone gets the honor. We need to pray prayers that can only be answered by God, that can only be answered by God giving his spirit to us. Prayers that express great faith in a great God who faithfully promises to do great things. So my question this morning as we close is this. What are you asking God to do that only God can do so that when he does it, He gets the glory for it. I'm going to say that again. What are you asking God to do that only God can do? So that when he answers it, only he gets the glory for it. Are you praying for revival? That's not something we can manufacture. For for God to to work in the hearts of many people and draw them together in a way that, that it's evident that he is there and he's present and that they're doing the things that he's called them to do. They're being obedient to him. Only God can do that. Are, are you praying that you would have boldness as you witness to unbelievers? Only God can save unbelievers. Are you praying for your neighbors? Are you praying for your family members that don't know Christ yet? You know, he he uses us. He continues his work in us and through us. But only God can save a soul. Let's pray big prayers to a big God who offers big things to us. Amen? Let's pray. Father. As we gather this morning and we look at this passage of Scripture that's, that's difficult. That as Jesus says things in this passage, greater things than, than he did, we will do. Father, I pray this morning that, that we've gained a little bit more understanding of what this means. That we can do greater things not because of who we are. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And as we gather together this morning, we're reminded that we will do greater things than he did because we will be able to point people to a risen Jesus, 
a risen Savior, a risen Redeemer. And Father, we boldly come before you this morning because you call us to. And we pray for revival. We pray that you would work in us. We pray that you would continue Jesus' work through us to this community, that we would see many, many men and women and children come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But it's going to take us to do our part, and it's going to take you to do your part. And we know that you are faithful. So, Father, I pray that you would be glorified in this place, that you would be glorified in this city, that we would be obedient to your leading, and that we would see many, many people come to Christ because we have been obedient to you. And we have seen you work, and you and you alone get the glory for that. In Jesus' name, amen.